My brother invited us to stay with him, assuring us that we wouldn't need to worry about paying rent or bills. I'm Jenna, and I work in finance. My husband, Arlo, is a car mechanic. We live in the house where I grew up, though my parents don't live there anymore. This house is actually part of our family business, where my dad used to be the CEO. My brother was supposed to take over the company, so he studied economics in college. He even went to Oxford University to learn more about business management. After he came back to the U.S., he worked with our dad for several years. Eventually, our parents wanted to retire and move to a peaceful place like Aspen, Colorado, to enjoy nature. They gave the company to my brother and passed the family home down to me, their daughter. So, my husband and I decided to live there. The house is in a great location, just a five-minute walk from the train station. There are shops, hospitals, and schools nearby. This makes it easy for us to live here, even when our children grow up and move out. I'm really thankful that my parents gave us this house. We were planning to grow our family and live happily, but we never imagined that our lives would be turned upside down by such an incident. After we moved into the house, my mother-in-law started visiting a lot. Knowing my parents own a business, she often asks about their money. Since we got married, Jenna, how much do your parents have? How much will you inherit when they pass away? She frequently asks. She talks about these things so often that I find it quite unpleasant. Not wanting to be too direct, I usually say, I'm not sure. I've never really thought about it. I already got the house, so I might not get any money. Even though I laugh it off and respond casually, she persists, saying, that can't be true, can it? Your parents are over 60. Anything could happen. They must have discussed their assets with you. She seemed so interested in the money that I was convinced she was counting on my parents' wealth. I already know how much I'll inherit, but I decided to keep it a secret from my mother-in-law and my husband, who was close to her. Then something shocking happened. Without any warning, my mother-in-law and my brother-in-law's family moved into our house. Around 8 a.m. on a holiday, the doorbell rang unexpectedly. When I opened the door, there were movers. I was shocked and confused. My mother-in-law and brother-in-law's family were there, saying, we're going to live here from today, so please take care of us. Their grinning faces sent chills down my spine. My husband woke up then, and when I asked him to explain, he said nonchalantly, what's the problem if mom and the others move in? The house is spacious, so you should be able to spare some room. He acted as if it was perfectly normal to let them move in. I was already shocked that we were all going to live together, but then my sister-in-law said something even more outrageous. Jenna, your brother invited us. Since he called us, we won't be paying any rent or utilities, so we're counting on you. My brother-in-law started going into various rooms without permission, saying, this room gets good sunlight, so give it to us. Arlo, move all the stuff in here out to the hallway. I felt dizzy from all this. This is my house, but they were opening rooms and trying to claim them as their own. My mother-in-law and sister-in-law's family have always lacked common sense, especially my sister-in-law, who once rummaged through my bag without asking. If things continue like this, they'll take over my room. Enough is enough. This is my house. Why are you acting like you own this place? I've had it. I want everyone to get out. I don't usually lose my temper or raise my voice in anger, but seeing these people move into the house my parents gave me without permission and acting like it was theirs pushed me over the edge. That's why I shouted at all three of them. But then something unexpected happened. How dare you talk to us like that? You're the one who should get out. In that moment, I felt a sharp pain in my cheek. I realized I had been slapped. It took a few seconds to register what had happened. I was stunned, feeling the throbbing ache in my cheek. At that moment, something inside me snapped. I couldn't live with people who would do something like this. This house belongs to me. 
I didn't want them living here like parasites, so I packed my things and left, planning to inform my family about what happened. I had to find a place far from here, so I rented an apartment for the time being. I'll have to commute to work from there. The moment I told my parents about what happened over the phone, I could sense their anger even from a distance, especially my dad. He's always been loving and supportive, both as a strict CEO and as a caring father who would help us out whenever we needed it. I didn't want to drag my parents, who were on the brink of retirement, into this mess, but I had no choice when my own inherited home was being taken from me. While I stayed in the monthly apartment, I was sure my husband and his family were freely using my house. So, I decided to follow a suggestion from my brother and father. A few days later, during my break, I checked my phone and saw dozens of missed calls and messages from my husband. I knew exactly why he was trying to reach me. Earlier, I had called the water and electric companies to shut off the utilities. Our house relies entirely on electricity and we haven't installed solar panels yet, so cutting off the electricity meant everything would stop working. It's hot right now, so living without electricity and water must be tough for them. I was just about to ignore it when my husband called again, perfectly timed with my break. Hey, what's going on? There's no electricity and the water isn't working. Did you cut off the electricity and water? My husband asked urgently over the phone. The house is mine, so now that I'm not there, why should I leave the electricity and water on? That's why I had them cut off. If I kept them on, I'd have to pay the bills even though I'm not living there. I can't accept that, so naturally, I had them cut off. After this, my husband was furious and demanded that I immediately restore the utilities. But just because he said so didn't mean I would agree with him. If they wanted the utilities back on, they should pay for them themselves. They'd always say, it's your house, so you should pay, but their words and actions didn't match up. I had no intention of renewing the utilities or giving in to their demands. I simply told them, if you don't like it, then leave the house immediately, and hung up because my break was ending. Later, my mother-in-law, sister-in-law, and brother-in-law all called me, saying the same thing. They wanted me to reconnect the electricity and water. They complained about the heat and discomfort in their rooms and how inconvenient it was without water, but I saw all of this as their problem, not mine. After listening to their complaints, I told them to handle it themselves and ended the call. I figured they were just being greedy and hoped they would give up and leave soon. Even after a whole week passed, they still hadn't left, so I decided to take action. I talked to my father's company's lawyer and asked him to send a notice to my husband. The notice said they were trespassing because they had come into my house without asking, kicked me out, and started living there like it was theirs. I warned them that I might take legal action. My husband was shocked to get the lawyer's letter. He came to me worried, asking why I had gone so far. Hey, what's happening? Why did I get this from a lawyer? Did it have to come to this? He didn't expect me to take such a serious step. He tried to negotiate because he knew a lawsuit would harm our reputation. They wanted to avoid lawyers, but also wanted to keep living in my house. I understood his thoughts perfectly. However... I couldn't accept their proposal, so I didn't give in to my husband's pleas. My husband got really angry and shouted at me over the phone, forgetting he was at work. He demanded that I stop and give up on involving a lawyer. His yelling didn't bother me. Instead, it irritated me more. I thought, who do you think you are, taking over someone else's house? No matter how much you yell, I won't change my mind. If you keep squatting there, I'll take legal action. Think carefully about your actions. Despite his continued shouting on the phone, I ignored him and hung up. It felt like a waste of time, and I had already discussed divorce with my lawyer. When I got home, I saw missed calls from my mother-in-law and sister-in-law, but I knew they just wanted to settle things. To avoid more distractions, I blocked their numbers. 
After my husband's family finally left and I settled into my own clean house again, things began to feel more peaceful. The divorce proceedings went smoothly with the lawyer's help. I arranged for a house cleaning service to make everything spotless. Living alone in a rental apartment during this time was comfortable, but being back in my own home felt like the best option. The house needed some repairs here and there, so I started thinking about renovations. My father recommended a good contractor, and I began discussing plans with them. Living independently was so freeing. I could lounge on the sofa without anyone scolding me. I could eat whatever I pleased without anyone commenting. As I enjoyed this new chapter, unexpectedly, after three months, I received a call from my ex-husband. At first, I didn't recognize the number and ignored it, but when the calls persisted, I reluctantly answered. Instantly recognizing his voice, my mood soured. We had agreed through our lawyers to avoid contact after the divorce. Why was he calling now? Changing his number just to reach me seemed odd and unsettling. I'm sorry, but we agreed not to have any contact. There's nothing left for us to discuss. I firmly stated, ready to end the call. Please, just listen to me for a moment. I need your help, he pleaded, ignoring my attempt to hang up. He went on to explain without waiting for my consent. It turned out that his company was going through a severe financial crisis, leading to a cut in his salary. Meanwhile, my mother-in-law's health was deteriorating, leaving her unable to work. My sister-in-law and her husband were struggling too. He couldn't find stable work, and she was working multiple part-time jobs to cover debts incurred by her husband. The situation was dire, and my ex-husband was finding it increasingly difficult to make ends meet. Upon hearing all of this, I could only muster a flat response. Okay, I see. After all, you invaded my home without permission, took over, and then tried to force me out. It was simply unbelievable. I feel no connection to people who could do such a thing and have no sympathy for your plight. Even if you tell me all this, it doesn't change anything. It's your family's problem and you need to figure it out yourselves. There's nothing I can do. I asserted firmly. My ex-husband became even more desperate. Please don't say that. We're in serious trouble. We won't even have enough for rent or food soon. Remember, we used to be a family. Please, I'm begging you to help us, he pleaded, his voice trembling with emotion. I couldn't be swayed. When I faced difficulties, my ex-husband and his family offered no support. Instead, they looked down on me. My mother-in-law, my sister-in-law, and brother-in-law always treated me with disdain. They mocked my simple appearance and traditional beliefs, telling me not to visit because I wasn't good enough for their family. They claimed my old-fashioned ways were rubbing off on them, disregarding how hurtful their words were. My mother-in-law exacerbated matters by pressuring me to have a baby immediately, insisting on strange herbal remedies, arranging unnecessary doctor's visits, and spreading rumors among the neighbors that I was infertile. Looking back, there wasn't a single positive aspect to my marriage. My ex-husband, once kind before we wed, transformed into a puppet controlled by my mother-in-law after our wedding. On the first day my mother-in-law barged into our home, I happened to be out for an appointment. She complained tearfully to my husband. I wanted to see Jenna, but she wasn't here. I want to be friends with Jenna, she said. After hearing his mother cry, my ex-husband immediately sided with her without hearing my perspective. She claimed she wanted us to get along, yet whenever we met, she would openly criticize me. Whether at home or in public, she'd loudly say things like, My son seems to have lost weight. Is your cooking so bad he can't eat properly? My sister-in-law and brother-in-law joined in, laughing at me as well. Dealing with people who behave this way became unbearable. No matter what they said now, my feelings toward them wouldn't change. I can't help you all, I declared. So I'm ending this call now and... Please never contact me again. With that, I hung up and blocked their new number.
Knowing my ex-husband, I anticipated he might try to reach out again, so I decided to change my phone number that weekend. But before I could, the four of them broke the agreement made with our lawyers. At 11 p.m., they showed up at my doorstep, demanding to be let in. Open the door. Take care of us. We're family. You owe us. They banged on the door, shouting without any regard for the late hour. Hey, what's going on at this hour? Please go back home. You're disturbing the neighbors, I urged as I approached the door. They seemed poised to force their way in, so I attempted to reason with them through the intercom, but they ignored me completely, banging on the door and creating a commotion. Dealing with their reckless behavior left me feeling overwhelmed. I considered calling the police when I heard sirens approaching from outside. Apparently, a neighbor had taken action. Upon hearing the police sirens, the group assumed that I had called the authorities and tried to flee. However, they were surrounded by onlookers, making escape impossible. The responding officers escorted them to the police station. I was questioned about the incident and provided a full account of what had transpired. News of the incident quickly spread throughout the neighborhood and reached a co-worker of my ex-husband, who was among the bystanders. By the following day, the entire office was aware of the situation. Already struggling due to a pay cut, my ex-husband faced additional consequences as the company took action. He lost his job and could no longer afford his apartment rent. Financial strain caused rifts in his relationships, even leading to his sister's family parting ways with him. Now, Arlo lives in public housing with his mother, juggling multiple part-time jobs to make ends meet. Even his mother has taken on part-time work in a desperate bid to earn money.